Am I making any sense? All right, my friends, here we go. We got ourselves another episode of Am I Making Sense? Today, I have a very special guest with me. Uh, you can find her hosting a weekly mic called Jokes on Us every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern and performing throughout the Zoomosphere on showcases and open mics. Please, everyone, make some noise for Ann McDermott. Woo! Yeah! Yeah! Uh, Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. I, you know, here's the thing about the Am I Making Sense podcast is I almost always screw up the intros and I mixed up on the soundboard there. I almost hit the crickets, but then I went quickly to the applause. That could have been catastrophic. <laughs> it could have been terrible. The entire podcast sphere universe could have just exploded if I would have hit the wrong button there on the soundboard. It would have but, felt like every open mic I've been to <laughs> last week. Crickets. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, that's my, that is every open mic for me, especially in the, uh, the Zoom era that we're in right now. I haven't figured it out yet. But Anne, I wanted to, I, I love your act. Your act is so hilarious. I laugh. I laugh at your jokes. You got a great personality. I I wanted to ask you a question that I've been wrestling with since I started comedy. And I, I'm asking you this speak first because you touch on dark stuff in your act. Right. And I like it. And I think it's funny. But I wanted to ask you, do you think anything can be funny? No. no. Well, I mean, I'm not like sensitive. I'm not like, but some things just aren't funny. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I hear, I don't know. There's certain things that I'm like, oh God. <laughs> um, you know? Yeah. But, well, maybe. I suppose in the hands of the right uh, comment. I mean I, I mean, I probably couldn't make everything funny. That's what I feel. I feel like. I'm, there are levels to everything and the level I'm at, I probably should leave some things alone. But, <laughs> right. but here's, here's what I'll say. I, it probably does have a lot to do with the comic because there are some things that I would never think to say, but another comic says it. And then I go, oh man, that was hilarious. But it's either just because they've done the work on it or they see an angle that I don't see or the way it's used, something like that. And so I, yeah, I'm with you. I think funny, here's what I would like to think in an ideal world. I would uh -huh. like to think given the right angle, you could potentially make anything funny, but I don't necessarily think that's the case, right? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think you're right. I think you're right. It just... I don't, I, as you said, like, I just don't have the tools yet for it or the yeah. perspective or the, yeah. um, but ten, in 10 years, I'm sure I can make everything funny. Hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> right? Yep. I mean, so, low expectations. Me. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, maybe we'll get there and not realize we've gotten there. Um, so let me talk to you about stand-up comedy. When did you get into stand-up comedy? Um. You know, I started doing storytelling first. Okay. And I took a class with the teacher. So anyway, to answer your question, about two years ago. Okay. But I went into it through a storytelling. Okay. And then I was like, no, I want, a, I want a laugh every. And I've got a bunch of friends who are stand-up comics, and I would go to their open mics and okay. shows. And I'd be like. So that was, you had the storytelling. I. I actually, for the first probably, I don't know, however long incur, I'm only about two and a half years in too. So we're kind of in the same class, so to speak. Um, and I got into stand up comedy thinking I could tell stories because genuinely, genuinely, generally, when I would be able to get my friends or family to laugh, it was when I was telling them something that happened to me. Right. And so I thought, oh, okay. Um, so I can take these stories and get on stage and then, you know, be a stand-up comic. 
But it took, I don't know how long I realized, oh, telling a story in front of friends and family and getting them to laugh isn't always going to work in a stand-up scenario. So I kind of changed to where I was thinking, now I have to write jokes and I have to think about ba 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 ding you know, kind of the, the setup and then the punch right away. But there are some stories that I've never been able to get to work on stage that I want to, I want them to work so bad, but I, I just haven't figured, figured out how to make it work. Um, so when you started as storytelling, were you able to transfer over some of the stories and just find punchlines every 15, 20 seconds, or did you kind of have to scrap the storytelling and start over? Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you know, I, um, I haven't been able to transfer credits. Didn't yeah. transfer. Yeah. Um, um, because you know, stories like seven minutes, you've got seven minutes and then you get the hook and, yeah. um, yeah, nobody wants to sit. Nobody that's seen stand-up comedy wants to sit through. And then I, and then I, um, I've told some story bits and pieces of the stories, like the porn audition, like that's, I've got a long story about that. Yeah. Uh, but I can just go right to it with my mother was a sex therapist. Do, do you know what I mean? There's. Yes. So do you think that's actually a good let, segue into another question? Do you think having a sex, sex therapist mother, do you think that helps add to your ability to find funny in things? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, you know, we're Irish. We grew yeah. up like comedy is tragedy. Tragedy is comedy. But um, here's the thing. It is funny. And there were lots of, because she wanted to be a nun. Her biggest dream was to be a nun as yeah, a yeah. girl. Um, but it's almost, it's sometimes it's, it's like, it is funny, but sometimes it feels like the easy way, like the low hanging fruit. Like the, I've got other stuff that I can work used to. Interesting. So speaking of the Irish, <laughs> I, I, so I feel there's a part of me who's always kind of like, people will say you're Irish, right? And I go, yeah, I'm Irish, but I don't fully, here's the thing with me. I am Irish, but I almost want to say in name only. I, I always joke around. I go, I probably have about as much Irish in me as Shaquille O'Neal <laughs> as Irish, you know, you know, because it gets messy, the family tree and whatnot. It's like, you know, in America, we have, uh, we have that uh, segment of the great depression where both sides of my family, you know, they were, they were orphans. So who really knows their lineage that came, came and went. So anyway, I guess where I'm going with this question, but I will say this, the people on the side of the family who are more Irish and Scottish, they usually are pretty hilarious ones to hang out with. Who would you say in your family was the funniest person? Uh, my, mm, my grandfather, everyone's so funny. My yeah. nephew, my grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather was a huge storyteller. Okay. Uh, my brother, Jack, is so funny funny. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That's good. So you're also a, a connoisseur of all things seventies. And I know this <laughs> from your social media feed. I was doing a little research. Okay. I wanted to get your opinion on seventies. Let's just say seventies comedy, maybe not even stand up. Can you give me some of your favorite comedy icons from the seventies. Well, I'm so glad, you know, I stood up taller when you asked that. <laughs> the, I was, I was really young in the seventies, but I lived for Carol Burnett, like Saturday night, Carol Burnett. I mean, we like, we'd have sleepovers and it was like sacrosanct. Um, and go ahead. I am a huge lover of Carol Burnett. When I, when I was, I go, I got to ask her about the seventies, you know, like deep down, I, I was just fishing. I hope she says Carol Burnett. Oh, you're Carol kidding. Carol Burnett is so silly. And I was very young in the seventies too, but see, one thing people don't realize is that it used to be things moved a little slower. So although I call my, my, uh, formative years, the eighties, I was born in 75. So my formative years really were, the, you know, 
80 to, to 90s, a lot of the 70s stuff carried over to us. And Carol Burnett was one of those shows that I was watching on reruns. And I think I was watching it while it was, you know, in, in production too, but I was watching on reruns into the eighties, man, she was hilarious. She was so funny. The laughs she could get with just facial, whatever. Right. Just amazing. Right. And her name, I feel like her name in, you know, modern day where people are just talking about the greats. I don't think her name is brought up enough. I well, I think probably because she wasn't stand up. Exactly, she was a, a what you would call um, kind of a sketch performer. Yeah. But uh, you know, we bring up people. Who do we bring up? We bring up like the Laurel and Hardys. We bring up a lot of these guys who were just more sketch, more vaudeville type stuff. Right, right. And uh, Carol Burnett. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm not looking at things right, but I don't think her name gets brought up nearly enough as yeah. one of the greats of all time. Well, in different, I think in like television, like, like if we were, if we were at the Emmys, Matthew, which we will be someday. Oh yeah. Which they laud him, her like TV land loves her, yeah. but in terms of like a comedic actress, maybe she's more known as, or. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I think, although I'm doing stand up comedy and I, I don't think I'll, you know, take on any of the other stuff like the, uh, the improv or the acting or anything, I will say this. I think the people I have always, who, who the people who have made me laugh the most were usually sketch people, the Carol Burnett's, the Chris Farley's, um, who are some other guys out there that were really funny. Um, I'm drawing a blank. But Wait, I'm thinking, what was his name? I, we were just watching Old Saturday, John Belushi. Oh, John Belushi. Like, That's right. Like, the Radner, like, those are 70s. No, maybe yeah. 80s. I don't know. Yeah, it's all a blur. It's all a blur. <laughs> now, see, nowadays, here's the thing. Nowadays, things turn over so fast. Whatever was in the public eye or, or trending, as the kids call it these days, and the trending, whatever... Right is trending let's say five years ago is almost obscure today you know but but in that 70s back in the old days things just kind of lasted right like you'd have a whole decade of something that you know people kept going to the brady yeah. bunch being another one right the brady bunch was something that the people in the 70s had and the people in the 80s had right yeah so, um do you think some of these acts. So there's some stand-up, stand-up acts from the seventies that I, I, I still go to, to this day when I just want to, like, I just want to laugh or whatever. The Rodney Dangerfields, oh. uh, the, the, uh, Phyllis Diller, um, yeah. who are some other ones? Uh, well, what is her name? Who had all the Joan Rivers, I um, guess. Rivers. Oh, yeah. Savage, an yeah. absolute savage. Do yeah. you think that type of comedy will ever make a comeback? Kind of the, the one-liner, the quick-paced comedy, or do you think the storytelling and the, the 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 quick comedy has just kind of merged for good, and we're just going to keep going forward and evolve into something else? Um, I you know what I I don't I don't know I don't really see that much storytelling with comedy. Okay, guess, but I know what you mean. Like Joan was like boom, boom, boom. They all were right. like. I guess it just depends on the person. Yeah. The comic. <laughs> so you've been hosting your, your weekly Zoom mic. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about Zoom comedy. Okay. Can you, uh, let's go over first the positives. What are you learning from Zoom comedy over the um, last year? Are there things that are good about it that you've preferred over doing it in person? Well, I love that once it's over, we're just end. And then I'm just right on my couch. I mean, I like that, but um, but more comedy related. Well, like I would never have met you unless you, you know, one of us were. I've just met so many people, um, and I, I, even just in this area, I've met so many people that I wouldn't normally have met. Um, yeah, with connections, uh, learned a lot. I think you know, I've taken a bunch of classes on Zoom comedy classes. Oh wow. 
Uh, so what other positives are there? I mean, the fact that, yeah, I think, you know, the lack of travel is really appealing, you know, like I'm not in a seedy bar right now. Yeah. But at the same time, there was some sort of allure to that. Is there some romance? You know? Yes. <laughs> like it's not, it's not real comedy until you smell like old beer. <laughs> Oh, I'm so, Feet are yeah. stuck to the floor. I'm so glad you mentioned that old beer smell. <laughs> Cause that was almost a, a Pavlovian, like a Pavlov's dog. When I would walk into a dive bar, knowing that I was going to go up, I would, there would be like a, Oh, we're here now. You know, once that smell hits you of the dirty bar. Oh man. I love it. I yeah. love it. But I'm with you. I, so out here, we got to drive. I mean, I don't know how, if you're, you, are you doing it all in the city, all in New York city, most of your stand up or. Uh, I live in Brooklyn. So I do it in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Right. So you're, I mean, you're hopping on the subway, right. Or yeah. something like that. So you're not necessarily getting behind the wheel. So that's one thing that I don't know if I can go back to normal comedy and have to drive 30 minutes here, drive 40 minutes there, another 30 minutes here to go around to all my open mics. Like I hated it. And I would always try and um, sync up with other comics. So at least you're not just driving alone (laughs) because driving, like, I don't know about you, but driving alone to an open mic, (laughs) that's some of the saddest things where you just, I'm sitting there going, what the fuck am I doing? (laughs) Why am I I driving 40 minutes to go to this mic for (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Get me alone. Oh, so then you go and you bomb in front of four drunks. <laughs> right. And then you go, okay, well now I got to drive another 40 minutes home or whatever. So that for me was always the struggle was the drive. Right. But with Zoom, oh, it's perfect, right? We're just right. click log in. There we are. Uh, we get to see everyone. We do our jokes. And then, like you said, there's the couch. Right. Things done. We just can relax. Get it all. But I also love that we can record it and see like. It's true. I I would record my sets and just hear it, which is great. But to see if there were any gestures I should do, which I really have not gone over it as much as I should. But. Yeah. Gone gone over my sets and. Yeah. Yeah. But not just the fact that it's available is great. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. We all have our archive of zoom. (laughs) So I don't know. I think for a booking tape, here's an interesting question. You know, you put together videos back when we were doing it in person and, and you would take your, your best cuts anytime someone recorded you or whatever. And then that would be your booking, your booking tape. Right. I wonder, I wonder if we should be throwing in our zoom calls now into the booking tape. Right. Uh Because we have probably, all of us have a lot more of the Zoom stuff recorded, at least for me personally, than, than in, the, in the real, I always say this, this is, I always say the real world. The real world, well, it's true. Here's the thing, when, when uh, there was a brief period that we were opened up and I, it, I got a chance to do a live show. Yeah. In November. And so I just had that taped and I've been using that, but. Nice. But st- you- to your point, like, you know, we've gotten better as we keep getting better, get more jokes. I think so. I think for me, the writing exercise and then the just repeating the, the stuff you're writing in all these different Zoom rooms, I'm telling myself it's all paying off, but I, I haven't, um, it, it'll be. March, I think it's like March 12th or something will have been the one year anniversary of the last time I did in-person stand-up comedy. Oh. So I'm, I'm one of these guys where I was just kind of like, I, I don't really need to be out there. You know, thankfully my, my job, they just pushed us out of the office and said, you're going to be working from home. My kids We've been doing this distance learning now for a year. They're not going into school. So I was kind of like, I'm fully committed into staying at home. And so I haven't really poked around to try and do any in-person mics. And I'm pretty sure I'm 
even though I've been doing the Zoom stuff, I'm going to be pretty rusty when I go in person. But let me ask you, how did, how did it feel making that transition from Zoom to in-person and then from in-person back into Zoom? Did you feel like uh, doing the Zoom mics helped you out? Uh, definitely. I had new material. Um, you know, it was really rewarding to see it, to see that it did translate, that the stuff I had worked on on Zoom did actually get laughs. Like, I know you saw my whole Kennedy business. Oh, I, did I love that. it. Thank you. I did that entirely on Zoom. Okay. And to translate in person was, uh, I was like, oh, okay, so this this does have something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love the, I love the, uh, the Kennedy stuff. Um, <laughs> we, we need to do, let's do a quick interlude. Let's do a filter. Let's do a filter interlude. Filter, okay. So uh, to all the audio listeners, I do apologize. Go, go to my YouTube channel because we're, we're about to do uh, a filter. Filter off. A filter off <laughs> because we both have recently discovered filters. So hold on. Oh man. Uh, video filter. Hold on. Here we go. All right. Um, I'll go first. Okay. I'm, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretentious. I'm pretentious, uh, spoken word Zoom oh, filter. Yes. <gasps> I have a beret and I don't know what's on my eye. There's something, it's following me. What do you think that is? A mole? Oh, it's a mole. I have a, beauty a mole. mark. It's a beauty mark with my beret. Maybe this isn't a spoken word hat. Maybe this is like a, a model hat. I don't know. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So that's my first filter. Give me your be- give me a filter right now, Ann. We'll we'll check it out. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Uh, oh, see after that one. Oh, here we. I don't have a beret. Where did you find that? I don't know. I don't know how I got any of these. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Beautiful class of twenty twenty one. Right, right. I wasn't exactly the best student. What about you? <laughs> oh, terrible, terrible <laughs> student. Oh, here's the beret. <laughs> oh, you got a red one. Look right. at that. Oh, my goodness. And a, a, the beauty mark comes with it. So I wonder, how did they pick red versus gray? Why did they give me the gray? Um, no, I was a terrible student. I think in high school, I graduated with, I want to say, maybe a 1.8 GPA or something. Huge. Yeah. How about you? It wasn't 1.8, but it wasn't in the threes. Look at you, smarty pants. No, no, it wasn't in the threes. Well, three was the highest you could get, right? 4.0. Oh, 4.0. Yeah. Mm. Twos, if you were in your twos, you were still, I mean, you had you were making an effort. I was a solid B. Then you were three. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're, you're I was still- a B. Yeah, I went to a Catholic high school. Those nuns were. Oh, and some of them were yeah. You know what? I have, um, I didn't go to Catholic high school. I went to something called CCD. I don't know if you've heard of that. I didn't go. Catechism. Catechism. I didn't go, but I know what it is. CCD. CCD. So the way I explain it to people is CCD is when your parents couldn't afford the tuition for Catholic school, but they still wanted you to have all the anxiety of a child who went to <laughs> Catholic school. Exactly. No, I just went to a Catholic high school, not a Catholic grammar school. Oh, okay. But no, I went to public school before that. Nice. But I love that. Oh, <laughs> you just, what is that? Is that a German? I thought it was. So when I clicked on it, I thought I was getting into a uh, spy hat. I thought uh-huh. I was going to be a uh, spy versus spy. But now that I'm looking at it, it is some kind of Schrudenidel German <laughs> thing. Schrutten Wiener Schnitzel. It's a Wiener Schneid <laughs> on my head. Okay, right. here we go. We're both, we are both going to be graduating from the, oh, look at you. Yeah, no, 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 that's not good. No. Queen Anne. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. That's a good one. I, oh. That one, very good. I think, you know, I actually did do a good one comedy set with that headband on one time. Oh, did you? Yes, yes. It was just too, it was too much. I couldn't pass it up. I had to do a set with that on. Um, Why wouldn't you? Here, I'm a joke pirate. Oh, that's amazing. 
This is fun. Oh my God. And it's like you're, it's like you're here in 3D. <laughs> does it show? Do you come up in 3D? I mean, can you, does it look like you're looking through? No. What is this? What is this? Oh, now I'm in VR. Oh, you've got the zoom hat on now. Oh, now you're underwater. No, no, this is, you know what this is? This is a VR goggle. What is that? Have you heard of virtual reality? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So in order to do virtual reality, you have to put on a goggle. And I went ahead and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is great. This is a good one. That is. Awesome. You put on a goggle. What do you, hey, so Ann, what do you think about guys with curly mustaches? Oh God. Are you into it? No, no pervs. They or you um. <laughs> tell well, me this. I just, you know what I, I, so I'm, maybe this is a California thing. So you said Californians were kind of more relaxed, which is true. We're a lot more chill. Putting a curl on your mustache just seems like far too much work. If you're growing facial hair, you already have to scrub it. I don't know if you shampoo it or whatever. I don't know what you do with it, but then to actually have to take the effort to put on wax or whatever it is and make these little curls go up. Who has the time for this? Well, and then here's the thing. And then the ones who do it, like, <laughs> I love that you just went profile. You just were like, but the ones who do it, first of all, they, you, you walk up and then they talk to you and it's almost like, it's almost like, um, I dare you to mention my, <laughs> you know, like, like, I'm going to act like I don't have this. I'm going to talk to this person. Like I don't have this mustache on. Yeah. And it's like, it, it's like the elephant in the room. They hit the, the yeah, girl I, on the mustache. I remember, so in, uh, when I first started seeing the curly mustache in Cupertino, because Cupertino is the home of Apple. And so we, um, in Cupertino, you may not know this fun fact about Cupertino. It is the douchebag capital of the planet. Oh my God. Per capita. There are more douchebags there than anywhere else on um, planet earth. But so I started seeing the curly mustache. There you go, Dr. McDermott. Right, right. Oh, my daughters would love that one. Oh, look at that. You're a bear now. Right, right. Oh, oh holiday. Um, okay, go ahead. I'm, and, just the, wait, back to douchebags. We've got to really. Yes. So I have the mustache. Huh? Now you're in a comic book. So I just remember thinking whenever I would see a guy walk in, if I was eating somewhere or just out and I would see a guy walk in with the curly mustache. I remember thinking, what day is it? Are we in Halloween? Right. Because that seems like it's very fanciful. A fanciful, and then, right? And then I would go, then I would think, well, how are you going to walk out of your house with a curly mustache and not bring a monocle? Right. right. It's that pretentious. Yeah. You know, if I'm, if I rule the world, I'd be making a lot of changes, Anne. But one of those changes would be that I would have a regulation that says curly mustaches are fine, but you must have them accompanied by a monocle. Yeah, yeah. The and if you don't have a monocle, then you must bring a top hat. Right. You know? Because, yeah, it's... They go together. Or at least have an occasion. Have an occasion. Oh, your kids would like that. So how many, how many kids? Oh, wait, do you know, I want to talk to you about something else that yeah. you and um, Haley spoke about and I wrote it down. Oh, okay. Call it's back. So much. Um, and it's so true. You said that to, you know, if you can just be relaxed as possible. Uh, yeah. Just relax. Are you breathing from your stomach? No expectations. And this is a quote from you. And I wrote it down. Oh my God. If you are relaxed, you can start any skill and it's going to pay dividends. Yeah. It's a belief okay. system I have. It's because I, I can tend to be like shoulders up around ears oh, and like, oh, let's have fun. and it's like nothing comes out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've had this belief because I, um, I used to play guitar a lot. I, I try to play guitar, um, 
at least every day or at least a few times a week still, but I used to love playing guitar and I, I would jam with a friend and he would just say, he's like, your shoulders too tight because I can see it. I can see, he goes, you got to relax, like forget, forget about what you're doing and just focus on, you know, like being relaxed. And then I started thinking about it and I started applying that analogy to other things in life, like skills I needed to learn or conversations, or I have to, um, through my work, I get in front of people a lot. I used to do training quite a bit and I would just apply the same rule, like just relax, just relax. And so when I started stand up comedy, I didn't really have a lot of expectations, but I did when I got on stage, I go, all right, I know I'm not going to ever be funny if I get up here and I'm too tense. So just focus on relaxing and then breathing from the stomach. That's like a, <laughs> that's like a common meditative type technique where they sit, you know, like your power resides in your, in your midsection, like your stomach. Yeah, so, right. uh, wow, this is the first time I've had a guest on the, am I making sense podcast who is able to quote something I said in another episode. So my oh, goodness. So meaningful. It helped me so much. And I can quote something from your Sean Gibbs. Uh, Ooh. But now that I remembered, you called yourself a failed musician. Yes. And did Sean say there's no such thing? Right. Yeah. So his take was, there's so many musicians we look at. Oh, shoot. I, I hope I don't butcher this. Um, but he said, musicians, there's a lot of musicians who burn out and even die. Right. And so the fact that you're still alive, you're not a failed musician. You're just, you're a living musician, but I just, I've never done anything that I've had commercial success with. Right. Right. But have you enjoyed yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know what? And I'm so glad you brought that up. I feel like now I'm the one being interviewed. So here's my, here's my take. Uh, and it's, it's a re referencing what you, what I had said with Haley. You know, life, uh, it goes so quick that the older I get, the more I just want to, I just want to be having fun and be relaxed, whatever that is. Right. If that's me doing stand-up comedy, if that's me um, playing music, if that's being with uh, podcasting, I just want to relax and have fun and have a good conversation. My kids, I want to relax with my kids because I feel like I'm 45 now, but I really and I feel like I blinked my eyes hmm. and I'm here, right? It went so quick. Right, right, right. And I, and I think I've been having a good time most of the, most of my life, but yeah, anytime I take on any kind of hobby, like music or comedy or whatever, uh, I, I try not to lose sight of the reason I'm doing it, which is to, to have fun. Huh. That's yeah. I've got a, a good friend of mine who's been doing uh, comedy for a long time and he oh. actually is a paid comic. And I, uh, I've spoken to him afterwards. I was like, oh, God, you know, I'm just getting so frustrated. Nobody left or and he's like, well, why are you doing it? Oh, good. Yes. You know, like, are you doing it to please other people or are you doing it to have fun? And when I can come at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. but. Um, it's not always easy because of course I want people to laugh. Yeah. I'm here because I'm a validation addict. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I'm kidding. You know, but val you know, I, yeah. but I can get into that frame of mind rather than no, I'm here to have fun and hopefully have other people have fun. It's not about me. It's about. Well, I think with comedy also, by the way, I don't know what this is. I just put on my head. I know. I was like, I thought we were off, off filter, but all of a sudden he's like, yeah, your daughters would like that too. Yeah. I think they don't play with filters much because they do zoom for school and they're not supposed to touch the filters. Well, oh, how old are they? 10 and eight. Oh, cute. oh, look at this. I'm COVID compliant. <laughs> right. So they're fifth grade and third grade. Uh, third and fourth. Yeah. So going on to fourth and fifth. Um, at the okay. end of the year. Okay. yeah. Um, so how did you get into comedy? So I, <clears throat> I, I've always loved to laugh. And like I said, I like goofing around and telling stories in front of friends and family. And, um, to your point, I, there are some really funny people in my family. My mom is hilarious. My aunt is yeah. hilarious, but I got into stand up 
because I, I go to New York every now and again, just cause I love New York. Right. And, um, my, my wife has some family over there too. I was there, I guess, three years ago now. And I, I said, you know what? I want to take in as much stand up comedy as I can because nowhere else can you get or go to as many comedy clubs in such a small radius as in New York, right? Mm -hmm. And I was going to comedy clubs and something happened. Like I got a high. I don't know how to explain it, Ann, but I was taking the train home late one night. I said, it was after I went to uh, see a show at Comedy Cellar. I want to say Comedy Cellar. Down in the village? Yeah, in the village. And I was taking the train back and I go, you know what? I, I had the thought, like, I'm not getting any younger said, I want to try telling a joke on stage. And, and I got this thing in my head, like, oh, I got to go try this. And so on the flight home, I was just writing down things I would say on stage. You know, you, I didn't even really know what a joke was. Uh -huh. I just, people were making me laugh. Comedians were making me laugh. So I go, I'll try and kind of think about what happened to me and use the same whatever tricks that right. they use. And so I came back and I, um, looked up open mics here in San Jose and I went to an open mic nearby me and I saw, I've told this story a few times, but I, I feel like it needs to be mentioned every time I tell it. I almost, I don't want to say almost every comic, but so many comics who were there were just roasting me. I don't know what it was. It's like, at first I was really, I was like a good supportive audience member. I was sitting at the bar kind of close to the stage uh -huh. and you know, I'm a, I work in, I'm a goofy white guy. I work in tech. So I had like the button down shirt and whatever. And comics were just lacing into me and like, oh, this, oh, whatever, whatever. Like saying, I'm like, oh fuck, this kind of stings. And then I, like I would move. So I went to the back of the room and I was drinking in the back of the room and, and they were still roasting. <laughs> They were they found you. Oh, it was terrible. And, and, and because it was the first time I had gone, I mean, I didn't, I put my name down, but I had gotten there so late that my name was like at the bottom. So anyway, I didn't get to go up to probably until one 30 AM. And, um, of course, AM, why did I have to say the AM one 30 <laughs> implied? Right. But, uh, I didn't go up until about one 30, but so many people roasted me. And, but when I, here's the feeling I did have, I got up and I said, whatever shit I said, I don't remember it. I, I, I haven't used anything I used in the first couple of times I did an open mic since, but, uh, I do remember when I got off stage, there were a number of comics who were pretty drunk <laughs> because it was already late. And they like gave me a hug. They're like, yeah. Man. And I remember it felt good. It felt like I, I ate a lot of shit that night, not on stage. But I ate a lot of shit because everyone was like poking fun at me because I was just this new guy in the room that no one knew. Right. And, right. Um, and then that, that was my start. And I really, I haven't looked back. I will say that my commitment, it goes up and down. Like lately, I've been really busy with um, um, work and my, my kids stuff. So I haven't been making as many mics in the last few weeks as I would like to. Um, but for two and a half years now, I've pretty much gone to at least two or three mics per week okay. uh, for a few years now. And I try to write, if not every day, every other day. Right. So that's right. how I got into it. And um, I think, yeah, it's been good for me just trying to think about things, but I wanted to circle back to something you had said about feeling bad um, when you get off stage, because I know what you mean, even though I tell, I, I say this, like I've got shit under control. I say like, Oh yeah, just relax this and that. But there's an, there's an obvious connection between what you write and say and your own ego. And so when I write down something that is funny to me, that funny thing has already intertwined itself with my ego. And so I don't consider myself, you know, someone who's looking for validation at all or this, that, but if you go up and you say three, four, five things that are funny to you in a row and no one laughs, it's impossible not to hurt after that, right? Right, right, right. Because you've you said, well, no, I'm I think I'm funny. I make myself laugh. <laughs> right? right, right. I when I write these things down, I'm chuckling in my head and going, Oh, uh, this is kind of funny, right? And then you say it in front of people and they're just, you know, like blink. <laughs> it doesn't register with them. 
like that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt everyone. And so I think what your friend asked you when he said, well, what's your motivation for doing it? I think every comic should be asking that question every time they feel bad. And if the, and if the answer is something that makes sense and wants you to, um, and helps you keep going, then definitely you need to keep going. But I also think that we're going to feel bad after a bad set. There's no, yeah. There's no getting around it. Like, I can't say, oh, but I'm doing this because I like writing jokes. Like, no, I'm, I'm doing this because I like to write jokes, but damn, I feel like shit right now. <laughs> right, right. But so, so like, I would hear, like, so a more seasoned comic, and I've read, like, people who've been doing it. So they, like, what can we learn from it? Like, there's yeah. no such thing as bombing, but what can you learn from it? But mm-hmm. can I just tell you a quick funny story? Yeah. I did do an indoor open mic last week. Mm-hmm. And I was so tense because there was a, it was a big room. But anyway, um, I, I totally forgot to take off my mask. I put like two condoms on the, on the mic. Yeah. Nobody laughed. <laughs> okay. But I, I was so tense. But so I back up a second. There's a guy who rides his bike around Prospect Park with a ball on his head, like a soccer ball and it stays. And that's sort of like, he's like a, and he he goes by the name of Jesus is King. Okay. Okay, so I like after, him already. Right, exactly. He hops off his bike. He dances with the ball on. Um, anyway, so I came out of the mic, and okay, nobody laughed. Nobody was really talking to me. Well, I was like, I'm not going back because it just didn't feel like safe. Okay. And uh, who rides by on his bike? Okay, so the, everyone from the mic is like, and I'm like, Jesus is king. <laughs> he didn't hear me. Uh, but like, everyone is just like, oh, that is, she's crazy. That's she, Oh, she, nice. So I'm like, okay, all right. And so now everyone thinks that no one was thinking about me at all. Let's start there. But I just thought, okay, that's the funniest thing I've done all day. Oh. <laughs> In the middle of Atlantic Avenue screaming, Jesus is king. I like the, I like the goofing around with Mike before we got shut down. Corona was, uh, it was already in the news and, and people, you know, were getting it in America and whatnot. And I added, I added the Mike hygiene to my, whatever you want to call like my first bit where I would go up with all these wipes. Oh, funny. And I would be, Uh I would be scrubbing the mic, scrubbing the stand for, and I would just let it sit. So people were like, what the, what the heck is this kook doing? And then, and then I would just say something like, Oh, you, uh, you'll have to excuse me. I don't want to die with you motherfuckers. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. like Perfect. So, um, but uh, yeah, I haven't, you know, that was, like I said, a week or two before we got shut down. So really good, uh, but it definitely, I think that's a good way to, uh, go about things. Um, so when you do the, when you do the in-person, do you have to leave on the mask or was it part of the bit? No, I totally, for, no, I put condoms because you know, they've got these mic condoms. Yeah. I put two. Good for you. But I told, I, cause I was so tense cause there were lots of people walking around without masks and I oh. was like, and I've got a friend whose boyfriend is in ICU now. Oh, I, no, like, I'm I sorry. should not be here. I don't know what yeah. I'm doing. Here. They called my name and I, as to your point about being relaxed, like my shoulders were up around my, I just forgot to take off my mask. Oh no. <laughs> I was like, I was already this, like, who is, who is this person? Yeah. Older than everyone there. Like they're all in their twenties. Like here's this middle aged woman who is not funny. And we find out she's a Jesus freak. (laughs) (laughs) The icing on the cake. (laughs) Just. I look at that kind of story that could be turned into a bit. I think. Cause it's so, it's just so absurd that that would definitely be funny. Hey, can I do, can I share my screen so you can see? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So let me do the setup here. This is a court meeting that's being ran over a zoom call. Okay. And then a I'll just meeting, a court hearing. Yeah. A court <laughs> hearing. So here, I'll just kick it off. Okay. Oh wait, what happened? Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to. Uh, uh, take, take we're a trying look. to. We're tr- can you hear me, Judge? 
<laughs> I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the, it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's I'm here live. It's not. I'm not a cat. <laughs> I can I can see that. Um, I think if you click the up arrow. Funny. Uh, oh my uh, god! That I, is can, I can assure you, I'm not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it make sure you. I'm not a cat. Wait, but the thing is, the guy goes, "I can see that," but actually, no, he can't. He can't see he it. Can't see that. He can't see it. He looks <laughs> like a cat. Oh, uh, I could assure you I'm not a cat. <laughs> that, that is advanced. I am not I'm not convinced that he was that ignorant. That's an advanced settings. I uh yeah, I don't know how he ended up with that filter. His kid I, probably was playing with his computer, but uh, I, I think um no, I I really do think that he was that confused. <laughs> Oh my God! We did. Did your your daughters loved that? Oh yeah, we laughed. We were crying. We were laughing so hard. So cute. It is the type of thing that you keep watching it, and it just gets funnier. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and what I want to do, we've gone. Uh, we're almost on the hour, but I'm adding a segment to the podcast because I have three listeners, and those three <laughs> listeners they demand. Knowledge. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we try and walk away with e from every podcast learning something, right? Okay. So uh, I I'm adding a true or false game show to. The, am I making sense? And today's subject matter for true or false is going to be the JFK edition. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> I. JFK. So oh, I know, look, here we are. JFK, he is basically, uh, what do we want to call him um, for Irish people? He's like... Uh, the patron saint of politics. Patron saint. <laughs> right? patron saint of politics. Yes. Okay. So, and you have uh, an amazing bit about JFK. Uh, actually, the whole Kennedy family. You include everyone in the Kennedy family. And so <laughs> we're going to focus, this one's going to be a uh, uh, focus on JFK. So, uh, and, and we'll riff on it when we get the answers here. So at the time of Jack's death, he was worth $1 billion. Billion? False. False. It's true. You're kidding. Crazy, right? So- I met his father was, but he was? Well, because I think he inherited a lot of his father's stuff. And so, uh, Actually, was his father alive when he died? Oh, that I should have done more. Oh, Rose was. I don't know. I should show you. I should show you my. <laughs> I've got so many Kennedy books. Up so on my you head. have Kennedy books? Yes. Oh, nice. But like, not like not like an aspirational. More like I love a fallen socialite. Like I'm obsessed with like Doris Duke ran over her butler. I mean, yeah. Anyway, do you know it's sort of like you know they say in comedy, um, comfort the afflicted, but afflict the comfortable. Listen, no, I'm obsessed. Like, I'm obsessed. Look, here we go. Can you see Jackie, Janet, and Lee? Yeah. I couldn't get through it. They're just not. That's a lot. But I'll read a book this big on JFK Jr. and his wife. Wow. But anyway, let's go on with the questions. Well, yeah. So one billion, and it was all from stock earnings. But here's maybe you can help. Wow. Me. Well, um, yeah, because his his dad was a big Wall Street guy, right? But what here's what I didn't understand: wasn't his dad also a rum runner or something? That's a bootlegger. Yeah. So I think that's how he got into this. Maybe that's how he maybe I, bought his seat or something. I, I think so. I think so. And I, in doing this true or false, I was doing some research on him and it sounds like a lot of John's the way he was actually all of the sons were able to get in through strings being pulled by the dad. Oh, totally. Oh, no, no question. Well, yeah. you know, the, you know, the theory, Sam Giancani, this is a conspiracy 
Okay. Theory. Okay. But the father paid Sam Giancani, the boss of Chicago mafia, because uh, JFK wasn't winning Illinois. Oh. But not in Giancani, but JFK becomes president, assigns his brother to be the task force against the mob. Oh, that was that was Bobby, right? Bobby. Yeah, and he got he got smoked too. Yes, yeah, smoked. But you know, I just the mob. I don't know. Oh my God! Then my other obsession. I'm leaning on an organized crime book right now. Look at you. Oh my goodness. Well informed. This is the perfect segment to have Ann McDermott on. I swear. And all my props. Yeah. Okay. So here's another true or false question. He was the only president to win a purple heart. True or false? Oh, in the war, he saved someone. Did he get a purple heart for that? True. He did get a purple heart. But was yeah. he the only president to have one? Yeah. So here he's the only president to have one. So there have been two presidents who have ran who had purple hearts. Um, John Kerry, also okay. from a boat incident. So um, JFK's, and we have another true or false. So um, I, I won't ruin it, but JFK's injury came in the boat that he was a captain of um, ramming a Japanese vessel. And then um, John Kerry, he had a boat in Vietnam and I think he got shot up or something and he got a purple heart. And then the other guy who had a purple heart who ran but didn't win was um, John McCain. Oh, okay. Yeah. But JFK is the only one ever to serve as president who had a purple heart. Wow. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't pull a name out like Alexander Van Buren. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I could not. I am the most ignorant American. I really couldn't name more than probably like the presidents that were around when I was alive, and then like maybe four more after that. Me too. Me too. I don't know where I pulled Van Buren out, but yeah. That was <laughs> okay. So another true or false question: the name of JFK's torpedo boat was PT one hundred nine. True or false? Oh, I don't know. I'll say yeah. false. True. It was PT-109. It did sink. I guess he ran it into a, a Japanese vessel or something like they couldn't torpedo it. And then he got all injured. But here's what I'll say. And this is why I brought up the whole pulling of strings thing, because I, I was reading through the PT-109. Um, I do my research for these questions. Right. So I was reading through it and his, he was a sickly man. JFK was a very sickly man even before um, his injuries in the Navy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, very sickly. He had, as a child, he had, what was that disease? I've forgotten it already. Um, but anyway, he had multiple ailments and he actually even had some kind of back problem, pre-existing back problem where the Navy was, they didn't even want him. They were like, oh, no. and so his dad hooked him up with a doctor in, in somewhere like uh, C Connecticut or something like that. And this doctor said, no, no, he's fine. But it was like a, you know, a, and so then the Navy let him in, but they only gave him a desk job. But John had his heart set on seeing combat. And so then again, his dad started pulling strings, got him through to this like cadet training school for, for boats or captains or whatever. He gets in there and then just by happenstance, something happens where he's down in Panama and he's able to get transferred into the Pacific. And then that's where he eventually saw uh, combat. But the whole time I'm reading this, I'm thinking, this, it doesn't look good for JFK because <laughs> he was basically not qualified to be doing all these things that made him a hero and kind of pushed him into public, into the public eye, or at least gave him a really good narrative when he did go into the public eye. But you know, when your family's worth over a billion dollars in that, in those it's days. So, yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Ask me anything about Jackie O. You know what? I didn't study Jackie O. So give me like one or two facts about Jackie O that the average person doesn't know. Uh, okay. Well, her father was a philanderer and so, so was, but maybe everyone knows that. Um, how, how bad would it be for JFK if he lived in this day and age, like for the me too movement, how, how do you think he would be totally just, he wouldn't get far. Right. Or 
who know? But you know, they had such a machine to cover it all up. But yeah. I guess so did Weinstein. Yeah, that's a great question. But the people he fooled around with, like Marilyn Monroe, um, I do. I haven't touched on the Chappaquiddick. I've got to come up with some Teddy jokes. Oh, Teddy seems like a real bad dude. Yeah, really bad dude. And you know what? Uh, Irish families still give him a pass. <laughs> they still go to bat. Like the Kennedys have a hold on the Irish people, don't they? Right. Because I would always be like my my parents, they would speak nicely of Ted. And I go, I don't know. He seems like, he seems like a murderer to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you watch that documentary? Well, he waited nine hours to tell the police. Wait, he had breakfast. He was chatting it up. It's not good. Yeah. It's not good at all. I don't know. I've seen multiple documentaries about it. I don't know if I saw the one that you were talking about, but every single one, it's kind of like the motivation is uh, when it's, it's everything, the motivation, the evidence and the circumstances are all, this guy's a murderer, but yeah. he served in uh, politics his whole life. So I don't know. Um, so Jackie O's father was a philander. Is there any other cool? I, I always found it interesting that she went on so we know her as Jackie O because she remarried. Um, Ari Onassis. Right. And then that's a whole saga in and of itself. He that- was in love with Maria Callas the whole time. Yes. <laughs> Madness. But see that most of the population doesn't know about these little things because we all, I think everyone just lost track of the Jackie after the Jackie Kennedy thing. And she went on to be Jackie Onassis, but there's just all this drama going on on that side too. Right. Well, in New York, we just were obsessed with her. Okay. Oh, here's another fun fact with JFK. Okay. Uh, he actually went to middle school and I want to say even some of his elementary school in the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, a couple of prep schools up there. Yeah. Man. In Fieldston, maybe? I don't know the names, but they say it's, everyone thinks of him as a, a, a Massachusetts guy. Oh, right, right, right. But he actually did do some of his early schooling in the Bronx because his dad was there for whatever investment stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. There were 11 kids. So many kids. <laughs> Crazy. So many kids. Wait, you have a lot of siblings, don't you? Youngest of six. Okay. That's my mother quit the Catholic Church because of their ban on birth control. She wow, said if good for her. She said if you don't you don't play the game, if you if you don't make the rules if you don't play the game. That's wise. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so you know what? I think the youngest has to naturally be funny just to survive, right? <laughs> Probably, right? If you're not cracking jokes, you're getting beat up. Wait, where do you, how about, do you come from a big family? No, I don't. I have three siblings, which I guess in today's standards, having three siblings is considered big. Um, but yeah, it was, I was the second. So my, I have an older sister, I have a younger sister and I have a younger brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I don't know who would be the funniest in the family. It would, pro- it would be... I mean, in those siblings, it would probably be me or my brother, but my brother's a pretty freaking hilarious guy. Yeah. Um, so he's probably funnier than me. But uh, yeah. anyway, and this has been an absolute pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, everyone go check out her weekly mic. Are there any other mics that you're uh, hosting or going to be uh, performing I'm on? Co-host. I don't know if you do. Um, do you know Mac? James yeah. Mack. Oh, James. I, yeah, yeah. James Mack. I used to go to his mic regularly and now I just have some conflicts in my uh, schedule. I can't make that mic anymore, but yeah, I, I like, I like that guy a lot. Are you doing yeah. a mic with him? I do. I co-host his football and bat every Tuesday night. Okay. Um, um, I do good one comedy. I love what else? Uh, I did some flappers, but that's kind of late. Yeah. Um, and have you ever done the Panda mic? Pandemic, um, Utah Sundays. It's like a. Oh no, I haven't done a Sunday mic yet. I should do that though. 
You're doing great. You're hilarious. Oh, but thank you so much. good one comedy. Sean is hilarious. It's so real friendly. Oh, and I do um Wednesday afternoons. So this is probably too early for you. 12 o'clock. Okay. Our time. Okay. West Side Comedy Club. I'll I'll definitely check that out. I uh yeah, no, good one. I can't say enough things about Sean and Mike and Ruben and those guys because I, I can't believe. Sean has been at it for a year now, almost a year now, every day. Two mics a day and a show in between. That's insane. Guy I bet he's, he's, he's probably improved. Yes. Like. Yeah. Big time. Cool. Well, all right, Ann. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have to do this again. I'll have to go a little deeper next time. I'll do some research on Jackie Kennedy or Jackie Onassis. And oh, we'll Rosemary. Rosemary. That would be good too. <laughs> okay. You're awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.